Hey everyone, welcome to the Radiology Scholar Certificate Program. My name is Ben Brendamore and today we're going to talk about gastric ultrasounds. So why is this important? Aspiration is a common cause of perioperative morbidity and mortality, and it can lead to hypoxia, bronchospasm, pneumonitis, pneumonia, ARDS, and death. Among surgical patients, there's a fourfold increased risk of ICU admission and a nine-day increased length of stay, as well as a 7.6-fold increased risk of in-hospital mortality. And the presence of food or liquids in the stomach before the induction of anesthesia is one of the greatest risk factors for perioperative pulmonary aspiration. So the anesthesia guidelines for perioperative fasting are you can have clear liquids up until two hours before anesthesia, human breast milk four hours, non-human breast milk, infant formula, and light meals six hours, and then eight hours you want to wait if you had fried foods, fatty foods, or meat, or large meals. Certain conditions can preclude the MPO guidelines or decrease their sensitivity, specifically conditions that lead to delayed gastric emptying or increased risk of pulmonary aspiration. In general, gastric ultrasound is indicated in any clinical scenario where the presence of gastric contents is uncertain. And in these patients, it's a simple and non-invasive diagnostic tool to evaluate aspiration risk. So again, it's most useful when fasting status is uncertain. So a patient who's an unreliable historian, has some sort of cognitive dysfunction, if there's a language barrier, or in physiologic states with delayed gastric emptying, like diabetes, acute or chronic opioid use, pregnancy, abdominal infection, or neuromuscular disease. There are no absolute contraindications to the procedure. However, if a patient has an abdominal wound or an epigastric bandage or cannot be safely positioned in the right lateral decubitus position, those are relative contraindications. To get the best picture, for adults, you can use the low-frequency curvilinear probe in the abdominal setting. And for kids or adults less than 40 kilograms, you can use the linear probe in the vascular setting. For positioning, patients are imaged in both the supine as well as the right lateral decubitus or recumbent position. The right lateral decubitus position is best for interpretation because the gastric contents are able to gravitate down towards the antrum. And if you were to only do scans in the supine position, this would underestimate the amount of gastric contents. So again, you want to start with the patient in the supine position and place the transducer in a long axis orientation in the sub xiphoid space, and then repeat the scan in the right lateral decubitus position, which will increase its sensitivity. Gastric ultrasound is performed in the parasagittal imaging plane. Therefore, it's important to understand the relationships of adjacent organs to the stomach when viewed in this plane. You can see the antrum is right here on the screen. And the liver is the easiest organ to recognize. And this is because of its large size. And it's located on the left of the screen, or cephalad, to the antrum. And then next we have the pancreas. This is located deep to the antrum and is often hyperechoic in appearance. And then we have the bowel, which can often be dif difficult to visualize on ultrasound due to the presence of gas. But this is, will be found on the right side of the screen or caudad to the stomach. And then some other landmarks you can look at. You can see the spine um, distally and then the aorta as well as the superior mesenteric artery. The stomach wall consists of three layers of alternating echogenicity and this can frequently be distinguished on ultrasound. The outermost layer is the serosa, which appears as a thin hyperechoic line. Next, you have the muscularis propria, and this is immediately deep to the serosa, and it appears as a thick hypoechoic line and is often the easiest layer to identify on ultrasound. And then the mucosa is the innermost layer of the stomach and this appears as a thin hyperechoic line. 
Occasionally, you can see five layers of alternating echogenicity. However, the two innermost layers are thought to be artifactual due to the interface between the mucosal layer and the fluid in the gastric lumen. The types of stomach contents you want to be able to identify are an empty stomach, a stomach filled with clear fluid, a stomach filled with thick fluid, and then solid contents in the stomach. So an empty stomach will have a collapsed antrum where the anterior and posterior surfaces of the stomach are in contact. This will appear as a bullseye appearance with a smaller collapsed antrum surrounded by the sonographically distinct layers of the stomach wall that we talked about earlier. And then important to note, there is often a small volume of clear liquid within the physiologically empty stomach and this is just due to baseline gastric secretions. Next we have simple or clear fluid, and this is hypoechoic and the antrum is enlarged in these patients. You also can notice some hyperechoic material in the fluid, and this is called the starry sky appearance, and can be seen in patients who just drank a carbonated beverage. The, pre the presence of clear liquids in the stomach should be followed by measuring the antral cross-sectional area in the right lateral decubitus position, and from this, you can estimate the gastric volume, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Next, we have thick liquids, and in these patients, you'll see an enlarged antrum that appears hyperechoic and homogenous on ultrasound. And this could be something like yogurt. The next pattern you want to be able to recognize is a patient who took on solid content. In these patients, the antrum looks distended and has a thin wall. There is some hyperechoic material and a curtain of shadowing coming down. Solids have a heterogeneous frosted glass appearance on ultrasound and structures located beyond the solid food, for example, the aorta, may not be able to be visualized due to the poor penetration of the ultrasound waves beyond the food. And then in the later stage, after someone has eaten a meal, you can see some dependent hyperechoic material corresponding to the solid content, and more su superficially, you see the hypoechoic liquid content with some hyperechoic material in it. So how to determine aspiration risk? In general, in patients with no antral content in the supine position, they're at low risk for aspiration. If you see simple fluid in the right lateral decubitus position, which is more sensitive but not in the supine position, these patients are also low risk for aspiration. However, if you see fluid in both views or any solid content, these patients are at higher risk of aspiration. If you do see only clear liquids, the next thing you can do is estimate the gastric volume by first getting the cross-sectional area of the antrum at the level of the, the aorta. And it's important to ensure that the measurements are taken at the level of the aorta rather than the IVC because the funnel shape of the antrum, if you take the measurements at the level of the IVC, you will underestimate the gastric volume leading to false negatives. So the equation you use is for antral cross-sectional area is pi times the cranial caudal diameter times the anterior posterior diameter divided by four. And once you get that number, you can plug it into this equation below to estimate the gastric volume in milliliters which is 27 plus 14.6 times the cross-sectional area minus 1.28 times the patient's age. And gastric volumes that are less than 1.5 milliliters per kilogram are considered normal and low risk of aspiration. In the perioperative setting, the clinical significance of gastric ultrasound depends on the urgency of the surgery. For elective procedures, cases should be canceled or postponed if the stomach contains solids, thick liquids, or a volume of clear fluids exceeding one and a half milliliters per kilogram. In the emergency setting, the risk of aspiration and optimal timing of the case should be discussed with the patient as well as the proceduralist. The anesthetic plan should include full aspiration precautions if the case must proceed. The patient should receive no sedation if possible, to preserve airway protective reflexes, or if sedation is required, 
the airway should be protected with a rapid sequence induction and endotracheal intubation. Depending on the circumstances, the stomach should be decompressed with either an NG or an OG tube, either before induction of anesthesia or following intubation.